one. Title is Dissipation of Fine Particulates Downwind of Poultry Houses. And um, co authors, uh, Casey Ritz, I believe, is in the room, so I'll defer all the questions to him at the end. But uh, the other co authors, Mike Zarek and Brian Fairchild, who are all, we're all with Poultry Science Department at the University of Georgia. And then Luke Nayer is with Environmental Health Science uh, Department at the university. Um, as, as a means of introduction to this, I wanted to point out a couple of things that we were not doing. We were not trying to measure, we were not trying to determine. We were not measuring emissions of, of PM 2.5, okay? There's a lot of other work going on there. Uh, we were not trying to determine what happened to PM 2.5 from point A to point B. We know that some of it is settling out, some of it is dissipating to the atmosphere, and so on. What we were really looking at is how far uh, or what happens to the concentrations as they uh, go downwind from a poultry house. Okay, um, so that's what we were looking at. Uh, we were also not measuring odors. Okay, I can tell you that, that being in that field below the houses and so forth, uh, the odors were still there even though the particular matter levels may have been reduced a little bit. But uh, uh, at any rate, that's that's what we weren't doing. What what the to, to give you a little background on it, much work has been done on emissions. We were not doing that. Uh, less work has been done on what happens. What we're really looking at is neighbor issues. Okay, um, how far away do you have to get from a poultry house before ammonia and PM 2.5 get back nearer to uh, background levels? Okay. We, we, I've reported on ammonia in an earlier paper. This one is concentrating on PM, on um, particulate matter, fine particulate matter primarily. Um, we wanted to measure PM 2.5 concentration at various distances from a typical broiler production houses. We wanted to measure it continuously and daily. Okay, the, the, the most accurate methods are the, the gravimetric me methods, which is a, which is a daily uh, method. The problem with that is it doesn't capture the differences in, in the, the time of day and so forth. The continuous does, but the instrumentation that we had to measure continuous was not as, as reliable and as accurate as the other one. So we, we kind of looked at both. All right, here's a picture of, of the layout. What we were looking for was a farm that had um, had um, Exhaust fans here, this is the predominant direction of wind uh, out, of, out of the west. Uh, we were looking for a house that had a large open area here with not a lot of trees or anything else downwind from that house. And also so that the fans, the exhaust fans, would be blowing in the same direction as the prevailing winds. And this was uh, the best house that we could find or the best farm that we could find in the area. Uh, basically, we set up uh, monitoring stations here at different lengths. Uh, this is 25, 50, 100 feet, 200 feet. Uh, let's see, I guess that was 100, 200, 300, and 500 feet. Another issue that we dealt with is you always want to look at what's, what is the ambient um, uh, levels. And that's, that's a tricky thing, especially with PM2, because there's all kinds of PM2 emitters everywhere. And uh, you know what what is being affected by something else? What we did is we we set up two. One here was uh, 207 meters out in this direction. The other one was at the far end of the open field, about 302 meters down down in this direction. And we thought that those would be far enough away from these houses and anything else that we could see around there that that would represent a pretty good indication of what is uh, uh, ambient conditions. Okay, there's a picture of the setup. The houses are here. You can see that the fans, the majority of the fans are pointed down, downwind or down in the same direction as the houses. At a weather station here, we had monitoring stations here and then further out into this field. Not ideal is the fact that these houses are up on, on fill. So that, you know, you might think that these, the particulates would come out of those houses and, and be above what we're measuring down here. To test this, what we suspected, we kind of proved with a smoke test, 
that the, actually the air and the smoke that's coming out of these houses actually follows the ground pretty well. And, it, and you can see it uh, following the ground as it goes, goes out through there. You do see some of it dissipating, which is what, exactly what we would expect. <clears throat> All right, so, the, so we had four tunnel ventilated houses. We were looking for maximum conditions, worst case scenario. We did the test in July and August during the last four weeks of eight-week-old broilers. So these are big birds. The, the, the time that they would be producing the most particulate matter, and in the summer when ventilation rates are high and the litter is dry, we did everything we could to, to, to stimulate or to simulate a worst-case scenario. We also did it on two-flock built-up litter. This was the third flock that, uh, that these birds were raised in. Um, that, that they're just a picture of, of the triplex cyclone that we used for the gravimetric method of, of, uh, of measurement. We used a dust track 8520 to, to get our continuous measurements. Uh, stations looked something like this. We, again, we were also measuring ammonia over here, but there's your triplex cyclone and the, and the uh, dust track. Okay, just details about what. Uh, what instruments we used. Um, we did on the dust track what we basically were measuring it continuously. We took 15 minute averages and there is always some data that doesn't, that's, that's not usable. It's just the, the mach machines are not capable of, of running all the time, I guess. And, and, uh, and we had some problems with, with data that we didn't get good data from. Any, any time that we did not get um, a get a data point from each distance because we were wanting to compare one distance with another. If we didn't get a data point at least one from each distance, we eliminated that data. And any time we had a day with less than two-thirds of the data, we eliminated that day from the study. Okay, so we, we did do some filtering there. Uh, we did use EPA procedures on the gravimetric uh, monitoring. Okay. So what did we find out? First thing, let's look at the ambient. Let's see how we did on the ambient. Um, this was control west, the, the kind of a purple color there. Control east was the green color. And this red one, we got to thinking about it, and uh, there was a Georgia EPD monitoring station that uses a t meter in Athens, which is located about 20 miles from, from this site. And we thought, you know, there is an unbiased, uh, something that's completely away from here. It's not at the farm, but let's just put that up there and see how it compares. And what you can see is throughout this study, basically what happened in Athens was also happening at these stations right here. It followed it amazingly close. You can see this, this time right here was, the, these, that was about a three-day period when we had the highest uh, ambient conditions. Okay, and this was using the uh, daily averages for the continuous monitor. These are the uh, results at different distances downwind. Uh, not surprisingly, the highest numbers are at the shortest distance from the house, and it tends to go down that way, although you do see a lot of gaps and some things jumping around and so forth, you can generally see that as you get further away from the house, the numbers do go down, but there are some exceptions to that. Not too surprising. And, and let's, let's just go back. If you look at this, um, this time, oops, this time right here, this, this is uh, basically August 4th through August the 8th. And let's go back to this one you can see August 4th through August 8th, that's ambient, okay? So what we're really seeing in that big time period right there primarily is an increase in the ambient conditions. Okay, so if we look at gravimetric readings, and I added a couple of things to this slide just for, for interest. We did have gravimetric readings inside the house not surprisingly, those are considerably higher than what we see outside the house. Uh, this blue line right here is actually wind direction, and these are the numbers for that wind direction. 
not a not a real good way to, to show this, but what it does show is that during that time of high readings, the uh, the numbers were close to 270, which 270 means the wind was out of the west, which is the way we expected it to be most of the time. You can see there is some variation, and in the southeast, prevailing wind doesn't mean it blows that way all the time. It changes a lot, but um, uh, at any rate, we were getting winds out of the west during that time period. And again, you see very similar results to what we saw with the continuous measurements. A uh, little more gaps in the measurements there, but you see again that high level during that same time period when the ambient conditions were the highest. And then this is the uh, downwind data, and you can see again the same thing. Again, this is in-house. Uh, 30, uh, this is, that's 100 feet, again, a little, tends to be on the highest end and so forth. So you see it dropping off as it goes away. Now, all of that's a little hard to quantify and, and say just what's going on. So if we did another test, okay, we'll, we'll get to that. But I wanted to point this out too. This, um, here is Atlanta, Metro Atlanta, which is a non-attainment area for, for PM 2.5. Here is Athens, and here was our test site over here. So on those days when the wind was coming out of the west, it was coming from Athens, and it was also coming from that non-attainment area. So probably the reason those numbers were so high is because it was moving that cloud of a PM 2.5 from Atlanta over our way, just to give you a little, little background on that. Okay, we did a, a statistical analysis on these, uh, these results, and basically what we did was we took all of the measurements in-house, all of the measurements that we had from 100 feet for the whole four-week period, all of the measurements that we had for the whole four-week period at 200 feet, and, and regardless of where it was located, and, uh, and so on, and we plotted those to, to kind of show what was going on here as best we could. All right, here's your controls out here. Here's in-house, and basically you see a, a t trend to, to go away. Now statistically, this one is different from control east. It's not different from control west. So the only statistical difference is really at 100 feet. If you get beyond 100 feet, you're basically at background level. Okay, You can see a little bit of a trend too, but, but statistically it doesn't show up there. So that's kind of what we, that's kind of what we saw. Um, so the results then, PM levels declined as the distance from the house increased. There was no statistical difference beyond 100 feet from the house. Uh, readings, there were readings above the EPA ambient air standard of 35 micrograms per cubic meter. However, background levels were also above the ambient air quality standards during those same days. Uh, the highest day, on the highest days, the wind was from the west, from Athens, or from the Athens area, and from the Atlanta area. Okay, um, again, as I said at the beginning, I was in that field. There was still odor there, okay? You know, we're not saying that we've eliminated any odor problems, but we, but the, what we're saying is that the, PM 2.5, and we found the same thing with ammonia. Once you get about 100 feet beyond the house, you're almost at background levels again. Okay? All right, questions? May have made up some, okay, I do have one, one slide, but it basically says the background levels of PM were largest influence on the level. Okay? Uh, increased PM levels near the houses, no statistical difference beyond 100 feet. Okay. Now, questions. John. No. I mean that's that's been that's been done. It's been shown that the vegetative barrier does does help. Yeah. Yeah. We were trying to say, okay, what if you don't have anything? You know, what's the worst case scenario again? Right, 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 right. 
Yes. Other poultry houses? Okay, well, there were some, uh, let's see if I can go back to the original picture. There was a, there were a row of woods just to the right of the, of the, the houses, so there were no, there, there were some other houses, but they were further away uh, and on the other side of a, of a group of woods. So we, we think that along with the fact that um, of what we showed with our ambient readings uh, pretty much eliminated what was going on with other houses. Uh, we were measuring with a continuous, the dust track was a continuous measurement, the gravimetric was a daily cumulative measurement. So we were doing both. Because each one of them has their own advantages. Right. Well, yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, both um, you know, ammonia and PM two point five are both. Um, I guess they're they're both targeted because you can measure them much better than you can measure odor. And uh, um, you know, I guess my point is that that they are not real good measurements of odor. Okay, they are not a guarantee that you that you have solved the odor problem, and of course we all know that that's what that's what people are really worried about um, is odor. But odor is much more difficult to, as you know, I, I'm talking to you earlier, much more difficult to quantify, much more difficult to measure. I don't, I don't, I personally don't have a lot of confidence in in odor measurements. Uh, it, we do as great a job as we possibly can, but it, there's, there's drawbacks to all of them. Okay. Did we measure temperature? Uh, it's. You know, it's it's a uh, evaporatively cooled uh, building, so the temperature inside near the exhaust is probably about the same as outside temperature. And of course, in August in Georgia, that was in those hot days, it was about 90 degrees or so. Yeah. 